Hi. So thanks for coming to our talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Brown, which is a joint project with 14 other researchers from Germany and the States. And Brown is about breaking TLS using SSL v2. Now, let's take a moment to talk about SSL v2, because uh, when I give this talk, uh, the moment I mention SSL v2, people always kind of raise their eyebrows and start wondering, is this even going to be interesting? SSL v2 is an old protocol, a 20-year-old protocol, that was published in 95 and was immediately found to be vulnerable to many in the middle attacks. So it was quickly replaced by SSL v3, which is kind of the beta version for TLS. And then uh, people pretty much forgot about this protocol. Uh, some people chose to still support it. And before we went public with Brown, the common wisdom was that it's OK to support SSL v2. And maybe it's even recommended to support SSL v2, especially so on your email server. Um, well, first of all, this happens, first of all, because security for email is kind of broken anyway. And also, the common wisdom was that there might be very old email clients lying around that only support SSL v2. So you might want to accommodate these old email clients on your server by keeping support for SSL v2. Uh, however, our results show that the mere presence of SSL v2 breaks security for TLS. Uh, when I say presence, I mean uh, an SSL v2 server that shares its RSA key with the TLS server. This is the drown attack scenario. We've got a victim client that connects to a server using a modern TLS connection. We assume the victim client doesn't even support SSL v2. But in round, the attacker observes the TLS connection and then later sends malicious SSL v2 handshakes to the server and manages to squeeze out little bits of information out of this server and then combines these little bits of information in order to decrypt the TLS connection. So again, Brown is about breaking TLS, using SSL v2 as a tool. Uh, so as, as I've said, what this uh, allows an attacker to do is to decrypt TLS traffic. It's obviously a cross-protocol attack where we attack a TLS implementation using an SSL v2 server. Those two servers may be the same machine or maybe even the same process, uh, the, the same server that supports both TLS and SSL v2, but these might be two separate servers that happen to share the same RSA key. And when you've got an SSL v2 sh server that shares its RSA key with the TLS server, the TLS server is just as vulnerable. And this uh, happens, uh, this is quite common when a company might have a well-configured HTTPS server that they care about a whole lot because HTTPS security is important, but that same company might also have another, an, an old, I'm sorry, an old email server lying around that they don't care about terribly because security for email is broken and they might not even realize the server is still running in some cases. And then uh, the email server can be used as a tool in order to decrypt connections to the TLS, HTTPS server. And this, this scenario is quite common, as we'll see shortly. Uh, when we take these scenarios into account, 22% of trusted HTTP hosts are vulnerable to ground. So I hope with these couple of slides, uh, we've managed to convince you that this isn't niche. This is a high profile attack and it's novel. Now, let's give a little bit of background on TLS. So in TLS, the client initiates the connection by sending a client hello message to the server and the server replies with a server hello message that contains the server's RSA key in, in a certificate. In the context of Brown, we assume the certificate is A-OK. -okay. No one is attacking the certificate. Now, the client, the client generates a value called the pre-master secret, which I kind of think of as the symmetric key or the basis for a symmetric key. It encrypts this value to the server's public RSA key 
and sends the RSA ciphertext to the server. The server can then decrypt the RSA ciphertext because it has the private key. And now, in theory, the client and server should be the only two entities in the world that know this secret value, the pre-master secret. So they can then exchange messages encrypted using this value as a key. And this is what they do. The client builds a semi-constant message called the client finished, encrypts it using the pre-master secret, and sends it encrypted to the server. The server should be able to correctly decrypt it, to decry correctly decrypt it. Assuming that's the case, the server will return the favor. And now the client and server uh, are reasonably confident that they are the only two entities in the world that know the value of this pre-master secret. Please note that if for some reason a third party is able to learn the value of the pre-master secret, that third party can decrypt the encrypted traffic between the client and server. So it's crucial to observe that TLS security, at least in this mode, is dependent on RSA security. If an attacker can decrypt RSA, they can decrypt TLS traffic. Now, let's move on to focus on the RSA ciphertext here. So when they taught me RSA in undergrad, they told me if you want to encrypt the value k, you compute k to the power of e modulo n, where n is the public modulo. That's not how RSA works in practice. Uh, in particular, there's a problem here where ciphertexts are deterministic. If you want to encrypt the same value twice, you get the same ciphertext twice. So in real life, uh, this is solved by a standard called PKCS1 version 1.5, where we pair the, the data with randomized padding to the length of the modulo. This is the standard. We start with the most significant uh, byte of value 0, then a byte of uh, value 2, then non-zero padding bytes, as long as are needed to make the overall length what we want then a zero delimiter byte, and then the actual data we want to send, the PMS in the case of TLS. But the moment we have padding under encryption, the question arises, what should the decrypting party do if they decrypt the message and see that the padding is invalid? Like a TLS server can decrypt the RSA ciphertext and see that the plain text doesn't start with bytes uh, zero and two, for example. So what should uh, the TLS server do in such a case? And the straightforward answer that most people will give you is that you should send back an error message, right? The server uh, should alert the client, tell the client, you know, I decrypted your RSA ciphertext. The padding looks invalid to me. Why don't we abort the connection or retry? But this is actually a vulnerability because if an attacker has an RSA ciphertext which might be valid or invalid, and they, know, they want to know which, they can connect to such a server, send that RSA ciphertext, and see whether they get back an error message or not, and then learn whether the ciphertext was valid or not. And Bleichenbacher's attack from 98 identified this vulnerability and then showed an algorithm that given a, a ciphertext the attacker wants to decrypt, shows how the attacker can send, can send little clever modifications of this intercepted ciphertext. For each modification sent, learn whether it's valid or not from the server's response, and then gradually combine these answers into decryption of the RSA ciphertext, into the RSA plaintext. So the conclusion here is, uh, and if you tuned out for a couple of minutes, this is a good time to get back to us. The conclusion is that the server has to behave as if the padding is valid, even if it's invalid, the server has to hide whether the padding was valid or not. How do we do this? If the, pa if the padding is valid, great, we continue along with the handshake. If the padding is invalid, the server will generate a random replacement unpadded RSA data, forget anything out of the ordinary even happened, and just continue along with the handshake as usual. Here in graphic form, when uh, the client sends an RSA ciphertext to the server, if it's valid, great. Uh, the server will decrypt it and use the 
decrypted ciphertext, the plain text, as the key for upcoming symmetric messages. But if it's invalid, the server will generate this random replacement or decoy and use that as the key for upcoming symmetric messages. Now, let's take a moment to discuss how this works in SSL v2. This is the SSL v2 handshake. It starts pretty similar to TLS. The client sends the client hello message and the server responds with the server hello message. Now, the client generates a random value called the master key, which is similar to the pre-master secret from TLS. Ignore this value for a moment. It, the client then encrypts the master key to the server's public RSA key and sends the RSA ciphertext to the server. So far, pretty similar to TLS. Now things get a little different. The server will immediately decrypt the RSA ciphertext. Again, with the proviso that if the ciphertext is invalid, the server will generate a random replacement. And use the RSA plaintext as the key to encrypt a semi-constant message called the server verify. So we look at this and kind of scratch our heads, because if you think about it, We've got this complex ceremony where the server tries immensely hard to hide whether the padding was valid or not. But then the server takes the results of this ceremony and immediately sends something over the wire that is derived from this result, right? So the, the result of this ceremony is the key, and we, the server immediately sends something encrypted using this key. So at this point, uh, things look a little bit suspicious to us, and it gets even worse when we use export grade cryptography. So let me explain a little bit about export grade cryptography. So in the 90s, the US government wanted the NSA to be able to spy on non-US citizens. So they decided that anyone outside the US should use cryptography that is at most 40 bits strong. And if you have a symmetric cipher that is 128 bits strong, you can reduce it to an effective strength of 40 bits by taking the first 40 bits, sending them encrypted inside an RSA ciphertext, and taking the other 88 bits and just sending them in the clear. Now the server can decrypt the RSA ciphertext, learn the value of the secret 40 bits, concatenate them with the 88 bits sent in the clear, and now get a key of 128 bits, and the server can now see the cipher uh, with this key and get an effective key strength of only 40 bits. So the NSA can happily decrypt that traffic. So uh, this is the, uh, the other 88 bits sent in the clear. So contrast this with TLS, where even if export grade cryptography is involved, the unpadded RSA data is always 48 bytes long. So it's a pretty significant dif difference in length. Now, let's take a moment to make a little observation. What happens when the attacker connects twice to a server and sends the same ciphertext on both connections? Well, if it's the same ciphertext, it's either valid or invalid for both connections, right? If the ciphertext is valid, the server will twice take this branch of the if clause and use the unpadded RSA data as the key for the upcoming server verify message. So the server will reply with two messages that are encrypted using the same key. But if the ciphertext is invalid, the server will twice take, will take this branch of the if clause for both connections the server will twice generate random replacement, which will, which will likely be different because they're random, and will send back two replies that are encrypted using different keys. To recap, if an attacker sends the same RSA ciphertext on two connections, if the RSA ciphertext is valid, the server will reply with two messages encrypted using the same key. And if it's invalid, the two server replies will be encrypted using different keys. 
Now, the attacker can break the 40-bit keys for both replies and compare them. If the ciphertext is valid, the keys will be the same. If the ciphertext is invalid, the keys will be different. So after all of this uh, trouble, this complex attack where the attacker takes ciphertext, uh, connects with it twice, and uh, breaks keys for both replies and compare them, the attacker managed to squeeze out this one little bit of information of whether a given ciphertext is valid or invalid. But we know from Bleichenbacher's attack that an attacker that can do this can decrypt RSA and can therefore decrypt TLS. So this one silly bit of information of whether a ciphertext is valid or not breaks security for TLS. So let's come back to the drown attack outline. As we've said, the attacker observes TLS connections. It records roughly 1,000 of those and can hope to decrypt roughly one out of these thousands. Now, the attacker will try to morph a TLS RSA handshake, a TLS RSA ciphertext into an SSL v2 one. Remember, those are slightly different because the lengths are slightly different. And it will use the SSL Bleichenbacher oracle we've just described in order to identify when the attacker manages to generate a valid SSL v2 ciphertext. We emphasize the client never makes an SSL v2 connection, and we, uh, most modern clients, uh, don't, modern clients don't even support SSL v2, and this is what we assume. We only attack TLS connections. Now, we've said that for each ciphertext the attacker wants to test, it has to send the ciphertext twice and break 40-bit keys, break the 40-bit key for each reply. So if the attacker uh, tests roughly 10,000 ciphertext over the attack, so it's 10,000 times 2 to the 40, it's, it sounds like 2 to the 53 keys tested overall. We can actually get this number down to 2 to the 50 with a small optimization I won't describe here. So now we have 2 to the, key, two to the 50 keys we need to test overall, and this sounds like an awful lot, right? This sounds maybe uh, feasible only for the NSA, uh, maybe infeasible for a small academic team. But uh, a wise man once said, attacks only get better, and hardware also only gets better. So this number might have been large once, but now it's perfectly doable. Just writing an naive CPU implementation brings the runtime down to 114 days with an investment of $21,000. And then we wrote a highly optimized GPU implementation that brings the runtime, the runtime down to hours. It's either 18 hours with an investment of $18,000 or eight hours if we rent the GPUs from Amazon for $440. So I, I hope everyone will agree this is pretty doable even uh, for modest hacking groups. We also have a variant of drown called special drown, where uh, th this variant doesn't require any large computations. So you can do it for free. Uh, you can read about it more in the paper. For, for this variant, 22% uh, of trusted HTTP servers are vulnerable. It's pretty similar in scope to general drown. OK, let's come back to this scenario where we've got a well-configured HTTPS server that only supports TLS, but this, that same company will, uh, might have an old email server that they don't terribly care about that supports SSL v2. And, and those two servers will share the same RSA key. Now, this happens for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's no protocol version in, a, in certificates. So if for some reasons uh, you got mad and decided that you want to support SSL v2, you don't, but suppose you, you do want to support SSL v2, you can separate this from your TLS configuration. 
you can't deploy SSL v2 without it affecting your TLS configuration. Also, certificates cost money. So even if you have two separate domains and two separate certificates, this costs money, and especially so for extended validation certificates. Also, multiple certificates are quite an operational hassle to deal with. So there are actually uh, a few good reasons for this, these types of scenario. It's not just negligence. Now, let's see how this works out in practice. So, first of all, for HTTPS, 17% of HTTPS supports SSL v2. So, this is pretty bad already. But this number all, almost doubles to 33% because when we look at the email ports, SMTP, for example, you see that SSL v2 support is at 28%. So this explains how we got from 17% to 33%. And the picture is pretty similar when we only consider trusted certificates. It rises from 10% to 22%. Again, because of the widespread SSL v2 support for email ports. Now, what can we learn from uh, this little attack? So the first takeaway for me is that export-grade cryptography has always come back to haunt us. So there were three kinds of, export, of cryptographic primitives that the US government decided to deliberately weaken in the 90s. Export grade RSA, which was the basis for the Frick attack. Export grade Diffie-Hellman, which was the basis for the logjam attack. And now export grade symmetric encryption, which is the cornerstone for Drown. So this has literally failed in all three cases it has been tried. But, curiously, we still have uh, the US government and also other governments pushing for more such weakened encryption. I don't know wh why they're still pushing for this. I think the technical lesson here is clear. This has literally always ended up hurting everyone's security 20 years later. Another takeaway, I think, is that removing obsolete cryptography should become a priority for everyone. And when you look at the stream of attacks against TLS during the last few years, you can pretty much trace most attacks to an old cryptographic primitive that was still being used, even though everyone knew it had serious vulnerabilities. For example, uh, with the Poodle attack tried targeting SSLv3, the fake CA attack in 2008 that tra targeted MD5, the multiple RC4 attacks, where well, everyone knew RC4 had major problems. Freak and Logjam, which we've talked about. Lucky 13, the targets Mac and Encrypt, Sloth with MD5 and SHA-1, et cetera, et cetera. And I just have to wonder whether Drown will be the last such attack that takes an old cryptographic primitive deployed and uses it as a tool to break security. I hope it will be the last such attack. I'm not so sure. At the very least, we still have Mac then Encrypt and SHA-1 lying around, waiting to be exploited. So maybe some of you will get to write cool attack papers on them. That's it. That's my talk. Thanks. Hi, thanks for your talk. At one point, you said you had to uh, morph the the one site, the SSL, sorry, the TLS ciphertext into an SSL v2 ciphertext. Can you say yeah. more about that? Like, how does how is that done? How do we do this? Yeah. Um, basically, this uses the standard Bleichenbacher technique of RSA malleability, where you can multiply under the encryption by any number you want. Uh, this uses a technique by uh, Badu and his colleagues where you multiply by uh, some cleverly uh, crafted number, which is essentially a fraction in this uh, group. And this preserves the first two bytes with high probability. Uh, I, I don't have a slide for this here. I'm okay. sorry, you can read about it in the paper. Okay, thanks. Okay, I have also one question. Um, so you also did a large scale notification uh, and do you know how many systems are still vulnerable? So are we still at this 33%? Or how much have we improved since yeah, in the last few months? 
Hmm. Uh, no, I don't have the number uh, by heart. Uh, we have an updated number for one month after on the Drone Attack website. Uh, I don't know it by heart, sorry. Uh, I, I believe it's around 15% uh, off the top of my head. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then let's thank the speaker. Thank you.